Hey everyone, it's Quickie Baby, and welcome back to World of Tanks. And a week ago, I made a video questioning the state of the game titled Is World of Tanks Dying? Detailing that the European server and the North American server has lost 20% of its player base in the last year. And I must say, I'm quite overwhelmed by the response to the video. A third of a million views in a week, 33,000 likes has become my most liked video on the channel, and with 10,000 comments, and some of them extremely lengthy. And so I must give a massive thank you to all of you inside the community for just your amazing response to the way I feel about the state of the game. During the video, I stated that I would be following it up with suggestions as to how I would change World of Tanks, let's say if I was in control of things for a day. And so without further ado, these are the changes that I would make to World of Tanks immediately if I was in control. So firstly, I want to talk about the new player experience in World of Tanks and why it's absolutely bizarre to me that in 2018, a game that is as popular as this still has an absolute garbage tutorial system. Now, considering I hadn't really got that new player experience, I actually went this month, made a brand new account on the European server called Plays for Free, didn't spend a penny, a cent, anything on it, so I didn't have any kind of advantages whatsoever, and played several hundred battles, and so I can see truly what the new player experience is like right now. Now, while I've got a whole host of other suggestions, they'll either make a, a follow-up video if you're interested in, or just deliver it straight to Wargaming, I want to highlight my, my key feelings. And that is that, well, sure, Wargaming now has a boot camp in World of Tanks and the tutorial system is far better than it was in 2011. It's still not up to scratch. You can complete boot camp within World of Tanks within about half an hour and Wargaming seems more intent on trying to rush you up the tech tree than it is actually teaching you about those low tier tanks. After you complete the boot camp, you already have unlocked a tier three vehicle. That's right, you get to skip tier one and tier two. And after you complete several missions, it basically gives you a tier four tank for free. And then bizarrely enough, once you've actually unlocked the tier five tank, Wargaming doesn't even want you to purchase the tier five vehicle. It just skips you and allows you to get any tier six tank that you want just instantly put inside your garage. And what's crazy about this is you don't even have to have played the previous vehicles. And so I just chose to click on an M44 artillery. And so even though I hadn't played tier one, two, three, four, or five artillery, just because I clicked on the M44, bam, it's inside my garage. The fact that Wargaming are doing this is just completely irrational in my opinion. Why are you rushing people up to the, the second half of the game, tier six and above, where players are going to have to meet tier seven and tier eight tanks. Some people have played thousands of games of World of Tanks before they've reached tier eight. They're going to be able to absolutely crush the new players who maybe have only been playing for a couple of days. And so I want to do three things to enhance the new player experience. Number one, I want to turn tier one, two and three into a safe place where people can learn how to play. And to achieve this, there are two things that need to be done. Number one, there have to be better in-game tutorials. Right now, Wargaming doesn't explain view range, camo, shell types, gun stats, what the hell is a garage slot or a barrack slot, but more importantly, it doesn't even tell you about the different types of tanks. It, it, honestly, it doesn't give you a choice. Do you want to play light tanks, medium tanks, heavy tanks, tank destroyers, or the other class, you know, self-propelled guns? Why not give players a choice as to what they want to try out at the start of the game? How absolutely insane is it that a game that has been out for seven or eight years doesn't even have a tutorial system that explains what the different classes of tanks are good for. Right now, the game doesn't even tell you what the artillery class is and why, as a new player, you are getting hit by tanks that you can't even see. It doesn't explain at all that there are an indirect fire class that will hit you if you do not hide behind objects. Wargaming are paying to advertise their game to bring in these new players into it, but they're not even providing them with the information to allow them to learn, survive, and to grow into dedicated tankers. Instead, they're cap catapulting them up towards tier six, where in my opinion, a new player, unless they're guided, would stand no chance in hell. Think about it like this. You could kill two birds with one stone, have a video pop up in the garage, which explains how view range and camouflage works. And if the player watches it from start till finish, it awards them with a pair of binoculars that then they can use in, on whatever tank they want to actually be able to see the opponents that are shooting at them. Talking about seeing opponents that are shooting on them, I'm gonna talk about something that I think is gonna be a bit controversial for all of the SEAL clubbers out there. That is, that I, I'm sorry guys, but you do not deserve to have overwhelming advantages against tier one, tier two, and tier three tanks. You may not know this, ladies and gents, but I can tell you in the last few weeks, I have seen some 
habitual seal clubbers. Take for example this gent who has played nearly 7,000 games in a tier 1 vehicle. These seal clubbers are preying against the new players, killing them over and over and over again because they can't compete at the high tiers. And so what is a new player to do against somebody who's probably got about 5 or 6 crew skills in a tier 1 vehicle, probably using equipment, possibly even using chocolate on the tank? They can literally see the new player before they can fight back. Isn't it more than enough that the seal clubber has experience on their side, why does their tank also just need to be flat out better than the new players? And trust me, this is not an isolated example. And one thing that I noticed about these seal clubbers is that quite often they don't even bother to purchase tier 8 or tier 9 tanks. They don't have any premiums apart from the rental vehicles or, or free ones that Wargaming have given them. They're literally sitting at low tiers in overpowered tanks playing thousands and thousands of battles just smashing the new players before they even have a chance to to grow up. Now initially I thought about addressing this by kind of putting all of the seal clubbers in their own little matchmaker so they have to queue for longer so they don't play against the new players. But considering the world of tanks population is dwindling, I'm not sure that's going to be sustainable and frankly the new players need to get into games as quickly as possible before they get bored and go and watch a YouTube video or go play Fortnite. Secondly, I thought, is there any way we can limit um, an exceptionally experienced player from just playing the same tank again and again and again? And then I thought, well, that's not fun. They, surely they can play the game however they want. And so this made me realize that it's not about stopping the seal clubbers from being able to play overpowered tanks and to play at tier one 5,000 games. I think it's more important that we arm the seals. Now, how do people get advantages at low tiers in World of Tanks? Well, number one, there's crew skills. So immediately, the first thing that I would do is give 100% crews to all tier one to tier three vehicles. Secondly, players use things like Sixth Sense and, and Brothers in Arms and concealment, etc, etc, to be able to get an extreme advantage. And so I would go as far as to at least give every tier 1 to tier 3 tank sixth sense. Or alternatively, maybe you could give all tier 1, 2 and 3 tanks three skills for all of their crew members, but prevent them from being able to move them up to high tier. In addition to this, seal clubbers use the advantage of having consumables on their tanks. And so while I'm not suggesting that you have to make them free, perhaps sell them at a reduced rate, but only between tier one and tier three. Or why not go as far as to have specific consumables like a, a small repair kit or a small med kit or a, a small fire extinguisher that you can just use for free on tier one, tier two and tier three. Next up, experienced players have a huge advantage because of the equipment that they can use on their vehicles. The first thing that I would do is as soon as somebody completes a, a tutorial where they, they know how view mechanics work, they're given one or two pairs of binoculars for free. If Wargaming are worried about people selling them, well, just make a, a special pair of binoculars that's given that works in the same way that only sells for one credit. Because right now, as soon as you get up to tier two and you have a 50% crew and you don't have a pair of binoculars, you literally can't see 200 meters in front of your tank. I think Wargaming seriously need to wake up and realize that players like this are actively destroying your low tier matchmaker. There's no reason for people to want to play around tier one, tier two and tier three after they've played 10,000 games of World of Tanks. They're playing there because they have an unfair advantage. I'm not saying to remove these advantages. I'm not saying to stop people from playing their seal clubbing tanks. Let's arm the seals. Let's make tier one to tier three a safe place where perhaps you can even reset your crew skills for free or you can demount the equipment for free. Take this part of your game that you seem to be embarrassed about and you're, you're rushing people past it because you know that tier one, tier two and tier three sucks and change it to be an, a wonderful part of the game where new players can learn and everybody, new accounts and old, have a level playing field. So next up I want to talk about the matchmaker and why I personally hate 357 matchmaking. And firstly, I'd like to clarify, I don't hate plus two matchmaking. In my opinion, plus two matchmaking is actually quite good for the game, but for me to be able to explain that, I'd have to do a whole video on it. For this video, let me focus on why 357 is absolute garbage. Now, if you have 357 matchmaker, that immediately means that only 20% of the players can be top tier. And so that means that if you've got a perfect player base where everybody's playing an equal number of all of the tiers, then you're only going to be top tier one in five games. 
That that's not what you want. That one in five can allow people to become very frustrated. They could literally get a streak of eight games in a row where they're constantly bottom tier before they get two games at the end of it where they're now top tier. But by then they've probably already so tilt that even when they're top tier that they're not even going to enjoy those rounds. I would argue that the matchmaker before the template system was absolutely fine. The problems that we had with the matchmaker wargaming were when there were more of one tier than the other on the enemy team. So for example, when one team had 15 tier 10s and the other team had 14 tier 10s and one tier 8, that wasn't right. The other problems we had with the matchmaker were when there were too many artillery playing, but now that there's a cap of three, it's not really such a big deal. I personally think that far fewer people had a problem with plus two matchmaking before 357 made it a problem. Another issue with having 357 is when you've got a platoon and for some reason they end up in a top tier matchup, platoons generally, nah, you platoon with players of equal skill. And so what that consequently means is that when a platoon with sort of your 45% win ratio ends up against a platoon of 60% win ratio, when all three players are in the top tier tanks and they completely outmatch the enemy team, it's just not fun. In fact, the only people who are probably going to be having fun there are at least for the first few games, the the 360% percent players, because they're going to mop up, they're going to get their 100% win ratio, but in the end, they're probably going to be bored that they don't get to meet any fair fights. Another problem that can erupt when there's 357 matchmaking is that there's just too few important tanks on your team and the enemy team, which can consequently mean that a super unicorn, if they end up in a top tier tank, can just be far more influential than if, for example, there were five top tier tanks. And so... Wargaming, while I would personally like all of the template system to just get completely removed, at the very least, change 357 into 555. And if this happens, you're not going to be bottom tier in probably about two thirds or three quarters of your game. You're only going to be bottom tier a third of the time if the player base pyramid is evened out. Next, I want to talk about overpowered premiums. And before I do, I want to provide you with an example from my stream yesterday. I was playing in my M44 on my Plays for Free account. And as you might notice, yeah, it was the Object 252U in the Defender that carried the game. And I thought, wow, cracking game for this guy. 1,559 base experience points, 5,000 damage. That's impressive. But considering that yesterday was the first day that the Defender was available in the loot box, I went and inspected this guy's account and I noticed that this was the very first game that this player played in the defender and the overall win ratio on this player's account was was 49% so he was a complete average player who in the very first game managed to just completely smash the enemy team why because of 357 matchmaker and because clearly our defender couldn't keep up and so this is the problem. This is almost the perfect example of overpowered premiums that, that are frankly just pay to win. A player gambles in a loot box, a player gets lucky, a player signs up in the battle, he gets lucky matchmaking, he completely dominates the game, and who has fun? Does anyone on the enemy team have fun? Well, no. I think the only two players who really had fun in this game were the defender and the non-skinned defender, the object 252U. And so consequently, if it was up to me, I would do one of two things. Firstly, nerf the overpowered premiums. And if I nerf them, then sure, a lot of people will be very unhappy, but at least I could continue to sell them in their balanced state. If that's not an option because it's going to annoy too much of the player base, then I would simply never sell the following tanks again. Because trust me, all of these vehicles are completely toxic for the matchmaker, and every single time they are sold, they make the game worse. Sure, Wargaming makes some money from it, they make some money now, but the more you make the matchmaker worse, the more that you're going to continue to get your player base to quit the game. So I would strongly recommend Wargaming to think about whether they want to make a quick buck now or whether they want to have a healthy game for the next 5-10 years. All of the premiums I cover are the Lefe, this thing, it, it, that there's a reason why the artillery was changed and for some reason this thing wasn't and now Wargaming keeps selling it. In f basically saying that if you want to play artillery like they used to be when they were absolutely cancerous for the matchmaker, just, just pay us some money and you, you can. It, it's fine. Go and inflict it on the player base. It's okay as long as you pay us the money. The Sexton. Why is there a tier 3 premium self-propelled gun just dumping rounds on new players that don't stand a chance in hell? Even though I don't have one, I would never sell the SU-76i. Even though I would personally love to get my hands on one, I'm sure I'd drive around a little bit and have a little giggle, but I don't need more overpowered vehicles. The FCM-36 Pack 40 It's got like 400 meters view range at tier 3. It's just insane. It two shots tanks. This is the Seal Clubber's wet dream. E25, same reason, this vehicle has old 
tank destroyer camo rating, which I think that I can get my E25 to still have about 26% camo when firing, which is just absolutely insane. There's a reason why Wargaming removed the class bonus from tank destroyers that they had more camo rating after they fired because players were very unhappy that they were getting hit by invisible tanks. Panzer 2J, well, this one almost goes without saying. This is the vehicle that Wargaming love to give out when you buy 100 euros worth of gold. This vehicle has the same armor as a tier 5 heavy tank at tier 3 with preferential matchmaking. It's disgusting. BTSV, its armor is too slanty and I know it's a bit of a hipster tank and while this is probably one of the the, the lesser of the two 100 euro evils as I'm going to call it, it's still too good. Then we've got two German heavy tanks. Well, actually, sorry, two German medium tanks that are just too crazy good. Their view range is too high. Their guns got too much good aim time and accuracy. There's just no need. Putting the 85mm back on the T28 and giving it better frontal armor and dumping it in as a tier 4 premium medium tank was just ludicrous. The T3485 M, for some reason this vehicle not only has one of the best frontal armors on any mid-tier medium, it also has one of the highest DPMs now to go along with it, with higher alpha damage than many tier 7 medium tanks. The KV220, what is there to say? Sure it's got a weak turret, but this is a tier 6 heavy tank hull at tier 5 with preferential matchmaking. The Panzer B27 740, this thing's insane. This is a tier 4 heavy tank with super preferential matchmaking that never has to meet tier 5 vehicles. And I have seen whole platoons of these filthy seal clubbers just destroying games multiple times. They're signing up in them again and again and again and again, padding their win ratio, doing the equivalent of stuffing socks in their pants, because frankly any numpty could be able to win 70% of their games in this vehicle in a platoon if you know what you're doing. And finally, the Object 252U, aka the Defender. It's killing tier 8, but you know, that's fine as long as you're willing to to gamble in some loot boxes to get it, right? Come on Wargaming, please don't try and make the quick buck now, think about the longevity of the game. All right, now I want to be talking about Wargaming's sale tactics, and uh, as you will know how I was very annoyed at them in my video yesterday. When I went to Cyprus, uh, me and a bunch of other community contributors got Wargaming to promise that they would never sell new content in bundles at an inflated price, i.e. But what they were doing originally is they were trying to take the American Tier 7 Scorpion, sell it with 5,000 gold or sell it with a month of premium, things that maybe you didn't want but you wanted the tank just to be able to bump up the price to 50 euros. It was very cheeky of Wargaming and it was kind of the last straw at least for me as being a tank collector that it was a ludicrous amount of money that they wanted to get us to start spending on the game. Wargaming promised to never sell new content inside bundles and for pretty much they, they've kept their word on that. However, with the IS-3A and the fact that it was only available in loot boxes this year and it's not available for purchase separately, I'm going to call out Wargaming on reneging on that promise that you made to me in Cyprus 2016 and at the very least in the future, please consider that at the very least to be able to call your loot boxes non-gambling that you should make all of the contents available for purchase outside. Now I'm not telling you to make it cheap. Sure, some of the skins are very valuable. If you want to charge 20 euros for a skin, that's fine. Do it. It would have probably been cheaper for the player to actually just gamble in some loot boxes to be able to get the skin, but at least they have an option. Why not make more money, but also give people more choice? Isn't that win-win? And also, as with the, the IS-3 example recently, whenever a tank is significantly changed to the point of now being interesting, I think it should be sold again separately so that people can now purchase the vehicle. I don't think... I, I just... I really can't stand Wargaming sale tactics when they put on flash sales of tanks and then they buff them down the line and then they never sell them again because they know that now that they've buffed them, they're more valuable. I feel like whenever they're changed, they should be available for purchase, which alleviates the pressure on the player to think, oh, will I ever be able to get my hands on this thing again? I know I don't really want it right now. It's not even really good, but maybe in the future it will be. I just feel it's so backhanded. It's not honest. And I personally really don't feel like you need to monetize in that way. Next up, I want to talk about overpowered tech tree tanks. Look, I know there are a hell of a lot more of them out there. Let me just talk about the ones that I have noticed playing my free-to-play account. And I'm literally talking about habitual seal clubbers who are playing... Look at this guy. 
nearly 4,000 games in his T67, just because I guess he loves playing overpowered vehicles. And so I would nerf the following. The Panzer 1C, sure it's absolutely hilarious to bomb it around at tier 3 and just use that spray and pray gun, but I think either its aim time, its clip damage, or its mobility could be just tuned down a little bit so we can lower its win ratio from like 53% down to 50 global average. The T67, for, for the reasons that I just showed you, this tank is not actually useful in the hands of a new player because they don't know how to use its mechanics to be able to dominate. The reason why the T67 is incredible is because once you've got a great crew, once you're willing to fire gold rounds all the time, once you've got binoculars and a, a gun rammer and a camo net on the vehicle, and you've got a, a full concealment crew, so you've now got incredible camo rating on the tank as well. You can outspot your opponents and you can use the flexibility of the tank to outplay them with your knowledge of the game. For a new player, this tank really has no none of the attributes that it needs to be able to give that person the, the chance of fighting back. Or shall I say, being successful in the vehicle. And so I would most likely maybe nerf the premium round penetration on this tank, nerf the rate of fire, nerf the mobility of the vehicle, or just somehow lower its camera rating. All right, next up, I'm going to be talking about the R35 and the H35. These two tanks have something silly like 40 millimeters of all-round protection at Tier 2. That's just insane. There are many tanks at Tier 1, Tier 2, and 3 that can simply just not penetrate these vehicles without firing premium rounds. It's absolutely ludicrous. I've seen these things literally kill the entirety of the enemy team during those Christmas events where there's lots of low-tier autoloaders in the matchup. <laughs> It's just absolutely outrageous. Next up, the Matilda, uh, the tier 4 British medium tank. Even though it's it's not really more of a medium, it feels more like a heavy with a godlike gun with incredible shell velocity, great DPM, enough armor to be able to tank, and something stupid like 10 degrees of gun depression, a decent view range. This thing is just the SEAL Clubber's dream. It's destroying games, and it's getting people to not bother to continue up the tank tree. Next up, I want to talk about weak points and armor scaling. In the last 24 months, Wargaming have seemingly been trying their absolute best to remove all weak points from enemy vehicles. Just think about the mouse and the Type 5 Heavy, for example. They've had all of their weak points buffed to the point where now you basically just have to fire gold at the enemy tank. When this happened, what Wargaming effectively did is they made it so that now your skill and your knowledge of the enemy armor didn't really matter because you, you couldn't get away with firing standard ammunition. Now the only option, even for a skillful knowledgeable player, was to dab the two key, load the gold to be able to penetrate the enemy tank. If Wargaming were to return weak points on enemy vehicles such as weak cheeks or having cupolas on the top of the tank which allowed you to penetrate standard rounds into the enemy vehicle, I don't think that nearly so many people would be getting frustrated about the amount of gold spam there is because I don't know about you but at least for me previously at least people attempted to penetrate you with standard rounds now it just feels like everybody preloads gold rounds and then when I'm driving my heavies I, I, I don't stand any chance the armor buff doesn't help against gold rounds or premium ammunition whatever you want to call it the armor buffs only helped against standard rounds and so it basically taught the player base to just not fire any standard ammunition anymore only fire premium and gold rounds and so now it was almost useless to try and use your armor in the mouse intelligently. The only real benefit to the buffs of the, the weak points on the Type 5 Heavy in the mouse was the amount of people that have to lose credits playing tier 10 and consequently have to buy premium tanks and premium accounts to be able to afford to, to still be competitive. Next up, I would probably do one of my favorite things if I was in charge of Wargaming for a day. I would change the Type 5 Heavy premium round to have less penetration. Because let's be honest here, the premium rounds on the Type 5 Heavy are just flat out better in every single way. They have the same penetration, but they just do an extra 300 damage. And this is the epitome of pay to win in World of Tanks. If you want to spend one or 2,000 credits, then you're going to do 1,100 damage. If you want to spend four, five, six thousand credits, well, gentlemen, then you can do an extra 300. And that's not a small amount. We're talking about an extra 27% damage. And so do you know what? That is how much World of Tanks is pay to win. World of Tanks is 27% pay to win. And I will be constantly saying that until Wargaming reduced the penetration on the premium rounds of the Type 5 Heavy to whatever you need to. Reduce it to 60 millimeters. Reduce it to 50 millimeters. Now, what does that achieve with the Type 5 Heavy? Well, it makes premium rounds a choice. It makes them better against weakly armored targets. It doesn't make them a round that you always go to just to be able to be better at the game. So Wargaming, if you do one thing from this entire video, nerf the premium rounds on the Type 5 Heavy, 
prove that your game is not 27% pay to win. Make the ammunition that you choose a choice, not just literally paying credits to be better at World of Tanks. And I really have to, to choose my words carefully there. When I say paying credits to be better at World of Tanks, let me clarify that the way that you get extra credits is through premium tanks and premium accounts. And how do you get that? You get it through gold. And how do you get that? You get it through your credit card. All right, next up, let's talk about Frontlines, a game mode that Wargaming added in the middle of this year. And it's probably one of the best things that they did. For anyone who didn't get to play it, Frontlines was pretty much 30 versus 30 with one team attacking, one team defending. And instead of the map being one kilometer squared, it was now nine times bigger at nine square kilometers. These battles truly felt epic. If you got killed by a player, you could respawn and then go back at them and get your revenge against them. If you saw that one flank was going really badly and you didn't want to continue to push it, you could respawn on the other flank and try and make the effort there and then go back to try and assist your allies later on in the battle. Frontline was absolutely epic because it gave us a break from the garbage 357 matchmaking, felt fresh for the few weeks that we had access to it, and we didn't have to spam gold rounds at our opponents because everybody was the same tier. However, uh, one thing that I want to clarify about Frontlines is that I don't think Frontlines proves that people want plus zero, minus zero matchmaking or plus one, minus one matchmaking. I think if I was to play Frontlines as the only game type in World of Tanks, I would become hella bored about this because it has a huge lack of variety. And so I would personally bring back Frontlines as soon as possible and I would make it a regular occurrence. Maybe bring it back every couple of months, every three months with a unique reward like a skin, a crew member or a tank for, for each one of the, the Frontline sessions. The only really changes I'd make to Frontlines is that I would fix some of the spawn locations and stop all spawn camping that was happening. I would keep the same epic feel, but I would still make sure that Frontline was not detrimental to the random matchmaker. Now, what do I mean here? Well, when you put Frontlines in the game, lots of people are going to want to, to play their tier eights only in it. And, and once everybody is playing their tier eight tanks in Frontline, then that makes tier nine and tier 10 matchmaking worse. Although I guess you could argue that tier seven and tier seven matchmaking are better. And so while I don't really have an answer of how you can allow people to play same tier matchmaking without ruining the, the regular matchmaking in the random queue, it's definitely something that should be thought about. Okay, next up, I want to talk about the economy in World of Tanks and how I feel that personal reserves have really screwed things up recently. Personal reserves like 100% plus experience have now allowed people to grind through tech trees faster than ever. Now, when people grind through tech trees more quickly, that means that they actually spend less time playing the game, learning how their tech tree develops. And so their overall skill is going to be less once they reach the top tiers. Also, players are likely to activate their booster when they play their bad tanks to be able to accelerate their progress in them. And so what this means is that we actually see less bad tanks inside the matchmaker, you know, like the ones that you want to meet occasionally. I don't know about you guys, but it's quite infuriating constantly meeting scorpions and defenders on the enemy team. Where are all the Tiger 2s? Where are all the T28 prototypes? Where are all the T44s, the regular ones? And the Ferdinands, they're all gone, I guess, because everybody used front lines to be able to grind out all of their tier 8 vehicles so they don't have to play the awful matchmaking tier that is tier 8 right now because of 357. In addition to this, players actually earn more credits than ever right now because of the credit boosters and all of the events that Wargaming have put on. And so what this means is that players can afford all of the tanks they want without actually having to play the game. Yeah, all you have to really do now is activate a credit booster, play during a Christmas or a Halloween event and play like 20 games in your tier 8 medium and bam, you've got enough credits to be able to afford that tier 8, tier 9 and just save a little bit or be able to buy a tier 10 at a 30% discount during the top of the tree. Now, I understand that anyone who plays World of Tanks now needs a bit of a, a help up because how else are they going to be able to get through all of the tech trees? But I would argue that all of this really leads to one thing. The fact that if players have more credits and they get to skip bad tanks, then we see more people spamming premiums and affording to spam gold rounds inside them. I would personally argue that one of the best things about World of Tanks is it actually takes a substantial amount of time to grow from tier one to tier 10. It was probably one of my favorite things about the game, collecting the tanks, slowly working my way up the tech tree, investing lots of time and effort in grinding the tanks out. I really looked forward to maybe next weekend when I'm gonna be able to earn that final 
bit of experience to be able to unlock the Ferdinand and I'll get to play it. Now it just feels like Wargaming skip you up as quickly as they can towards tier 6 even if you're a new player, throw experience boosters at you left, right and centre to allow you to, to literally probably grind up towards tier 8, 9 or 10 within a few days. Next up, I want to talk about bonds in World of Tanks. And for anyone who doesn't know, bonds are a special currency that you can get for playing the Ranked Battles game mode, as well as in very small amounts um, uh, for other events that Wargaming release. Now, I actually disagree with the idea of bonds because currently the only really good thing that you can spend them on are advantages inside the battle. You can buy improved equipment that pretty much just makes you about 3% better than all of the other tankers out there. And the people who actually get the bonds are already the people people who are playing ranked battles the best players so why in hell's name would you want to be giving the best players an advantage and so i would completely change the ideology of bonds from being a currency that gives the best players an edge over all of the other tankers to being the most valuable currency in world of tanks not because they give you an advantage because they can give you some really kick-ass sought after goods all right now firstly to take away the whole pay to win or advantages that bonds can give you i would immediately remove all improved equipment from the game and any players that had spent bonds on them just refund the players because as i said these best players who get these bonds or the most dedicated players do not need an advantage they're going to be wanting to get these bonds to because they give them really cool stuff consequently to be able to make sure that bonds were were valuable and that it, they were a reward for not just a player dumping money into the game but a reward for player effort to make them feel special i would ensure that the bonds are never sold for money either in loot boxes or in the premium shop and they're only awarded for player effort now what would i i allow that these bonds to purchase well i think that you should be able to buy epic skins or epic styles for your tanks a lot like what we saw in the loot boxes recently or alternatively you can use the bonds to buy special tanks maybe even the clan wars reward vehicles and if the clan wars reward vehicles are too precious and all of the clan wars players are going to be an uproar about purchasing them for bonds then maybe sell unique and rare tanks that would be really sought after by the community and to enable more players to be able to get more of this sought after currency either with their skill or with their effort i would award more bonds in more frequent events effectively i would want to turn bonds from being something that you feel like you're forced to have to grind to just be competitive at the game to being something that you want to grind so that you can get fat epic rewards that don't necessarily just mean that you're going to be better than the next tanker Finally, I want to talk about some things that I couldn't really address in this video because I'm still trying to figure them out. Firstly, let's talk about it. Premium ammo, gold rounds, whatever you want to be calling them. My problem is, is that the game has basically been completely intrinsically balanced around their use. Let's face it, we've seen the Type 5 Heavy and the mouse buffed specifically so that they're useful against standard rounds but still not useful at all against premium rounds. There are vehicles in the game that have frankly been balanced around premium round usage and the idea of just nerfing premium rounds now just think about what that would do who benefits if you nerf the damage of premium rounds for example all that it does is it makes armored vehicles better so let's say tomorrow i become ceo of wargaming and i say that oh all premium rounds are now going to do 50 percent less damage what does that mean well what that means is that basically i would jump out and play my t110 e3 I would go play my mouse, I'd go play my Type 5 Heavy, I'd probably play my IS-7 a lot more, because all of those vehicles would receive a mega buff. What vehicles would I not play any longer? Mm, yeah, light tanks, medium tanks, some tank destroyers, I guess, that don't rely on their armor. If you simply nerf the damage or nerf the penetration of the premium rounds, it just makes armored tanks better and vehicles that don't depend on the armor at all like the leopard for example are going to get worse by proxy if wargaming were to nerf the damage of premium rounds or nerf the penetration of premium rounds there has to be one other thing that's done and that is a complete rebalance of all of the other heavily armored tanks in the game i'm literally saying Every vehicle that you would have to fire premium rounds at to stand a chance in penetrating would have to have their armor nerfed. We're talking about mouse cheeks nerfed, type 5 heavy, capola, 
and it's it's mid plate nerfed object 268 version 4 nerfed the, the list goes on and to be able to achieve that a complete rebalancing of all of the armor of of heavily armored vehicles in the game it sounds like a lot of work and i would probably try and work on fixing all of the other things that i've mentioned especially the new player experience before then the reason why more people are firing premium rounds now and they're becoming an issue in the game is because the economy is giving people too many credits next up there's another big thing that i'm trying to figure out and that is the health at lower tiers my problem is that new players are dying too quickly and they don't have a chance to be able to learn from their mistakes or, or react to the situation as it's developing many vehicles of equal tier can literally two shot if not one shot the enemy tank i don't know how i would do it but i would somehow try and increase tank longevity at low tiers with perhaps a percentage based health loss maybe that could help again i'm still trying to figure out these things and you know what there's also another thing that i should add to the list like why spgs are more annoying than ever i don't know i don't know how i would fix it all, all i all i want to say is that they're still bloody annoying and i think that they hit you far too often because of their large splash radius. They don't do enough damage to make you go back to the garage, but slowly but surely they're going to whittle you down, which is just incredibly frustrating. You lose your crew members constantly. And importantly, there's that god-awful stun mechanic that I have no idea why it was ever thought that that would make us more happy to play against artillery. The fact that we can no longer fight back for the next up to 20 seconds. Whoa, gee, that's a lot of fun. And if any of you have suggestions to any of these things or you want to add to the discussion, you're more than welcome to do so in the, in the comments down below. Anyway, ladies and gents, that was a long video, but I felt like I, I owed it to you. I'm trying harder than ever to put the effort in to be able to do my research, to be able to think around these issues and not just cry about it, but offer right now solutions or even promises that Wargaming could make us to restore our faith in their game and what they want to do with it going forwards. And so to any of the Wargaming staff members out there, I, I, I'm ready to discuss any of this. If you want to do it either in public or in private, on the record, off the record, I'm all ears. I want to help in any way I can because I bloody love this game. But you know what, if there's one thing that I would love to do more than anything in this list, let's improve the new player experience. So anyway, whew, ladies and gents, that's it. This was a long one. Congrats if you made it to the end. And while I know not everybody is going to be happy with the suggestions that I make and Remember, we all have different opinions. I'm trying to listen to as many of them as possible so I can continue to improve and form my opinion so I can make the very best suggestions possible. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what you all have to say in the comments. Anyway, I did it. I, I followed up on a video. I told you a week ago I was going to do this. I did it. Enjoy. And as always, thank you so much for watching. You've been epic and hopefully I'll see you soon.